Hello, my name is Zeus Sardu, and this is my presentation of Zeus Muse Fragrance Pharmacy. The point of this presentation is simple. I'm really just trying to showcase that I'm an expert perfumer. It's really not an ad. It could be an ad. I suppose if someone actually took the time to watch this video, but this right here, this display, this is an ad. I mean, whether you're talking about using it in billboards, in magazines, perhaps this whole piece by itself cannot really be used in a magazine. This individual piece right here, this perfume template can be used in a magazine, but I don't know. I mean, I guess you could put this in between two pages on a magazine, but the point of this presentation is not necessarily to be an ad. I'm trying to create a video that showcases I know what I'm doing as a perfumer and I'm the best in the world. So I think that this video can actually communicate that. As absurd as it may sound that an hour and 20 minute video can actually communicate that I'm the best in the world at what I do. I think it does. Um, perhaps you would have to go through and follow through with other perfumes beyond just one perfume, but this perfume by itself is better than any other perfume on the market. You might say that some other perfume has a fragrance that can kind of compete with my fragrance, but so far as the actual craftsmanship of the perfume, if you're talking about the art of perfume, if it is an art form, there is no other perfume on the market that is this perfected and, and thought out and meticulous in marketing and its product and perfume formula than this perfume. But at the same time, I've designed a lot of them. So, but this one specifically is a great example of what I can do. So I'm just really trying to show people what I can do. And I hope you enjoyed this presentation. It was kind of created for Carly and her subordinates to try to get in contact with her because of course it's a Carly Class perfume, but we'll see what happens. So I hope you enjoyed this video. You might be wondering why does it take over an hour to summarize the contents of just one perfume? Well, the reason for that is because a lot of what I'm doing in, in perfumes has never been done before. It's unprecedented. For example, this perfume template is utterly revolutionary and there's a lot more behind it than just a, a simple glance. Now, perhaps if all the other perfumes that I will summarize in the future, and I've designed a lot of them, um, will not be as long of videos because I can just go through and summarize each one of the perfume ingredients in the brand and all the little simple things that need to be summarized when, some, when introducing a new perfume that need to be introduced. But the problem is when you have a new system, This is, I've developed a system for designing perfumes that is highly universal to each perfume. There are variations for sure, but there's systems in, in, in everything. And like if you were teaching someone how to write a screenplay, there's a system for kind of how to do that, do, how to do that. That's pretty much universal to all screenplays. I mean, now perhaps if you're talking about writing a, t a, t a particular type of script, then that's a little bit different too, or you're talking about the particularity of the script that's different, but it, it was the most difficult to get into summarizing the very first perfume. I developed this project for LeBron James where I was gonna submit work to him, and it was, the longest summation of the perfume was his perfume. Not not just because his perfume was all that complicated, but just whatever perfume that I select to, to introduce my first perfume is always going to be the most complicated. So that's why. After that, or after this summation, the summarization of all my other perfumes that I will produce in the future will not be as lengthy if I do videos like this frequently, which I'm not sure if I will. This may be a one-time spiel, but we'll see. So... I'm gonna talk about the title, Zeus Muse Fragrance Pharmacy. I played around with calling this company Fragrance Farm. I, I just thought that was clever too, like farm, because it's a kind of plan where it sounds like a farm, like a place where you have animals and milk cows and stuff. Um, and the term pharmacy is really kind of addressing that perfume ingredients are all drugs. Um, you may disagree with that. And I, I, at first when I heard people talking about like all these effects that these essential oil ingredients do have. I was a little bit skeptical. Um, I've been designing perfumes for a long time and I didn't go around, I didn't go to perfume school. So um, I kind of rediscovered everything from scratch and um, I've read a couple books, but I don't think any of those were terribly helpful. So um, I guess w w the foundation of perfume is really evolution 
and every single scent that exists exists from from an evolutionary perspective and when you say let's say a rose smells good the fact that you say it smells good is the is in by itself that the fact that it's a drug i mean it's it's not experienced like ooh that it's the same thing as food like ooh that tastes good you know you don't think that's a drug but it is a drug it's just not something that you associate as being a drug like the sensation of an orgasm or this you know any other sensation of pleasure but they are drugs when you feel positive or negative that is a drug induced effect on the brain that um i guess you know causes you to feel a certain way in relationship to the stimulus of certain perfume ingredients but let's move forward here we have the logo for Zeus Muse. Um, the reason that I called myself Zeus is actually a reference to an electrical invention of mine. I was actually going to go with the name Ra's Day for a long time. I always wanted to go with some sort of God name. My real name is Russell Williams, um, or at least the name that my parents gave me. Um, but uh, I kind of ended up going with Zeus, being that this electrical invention, and I also really like the phrase Zeus Muse. I never really realized this until later on in my life. I've certainly heard of the term Muse. Some people aren't super familiar with it. They've heard of it, but they're not like familiar with what it means. People in the fashion industry certainly are familiar with what a Muse is. But um, I have a very Muse-driven personality. Anything that I create, I'm constantly putting a Muse in or building a Muse around the format, or I design something, and I kind of try to find a way to build a Muse it. So I've designed several cities, buildings, a lot of different things. And like, I was gonna, when I, after I designed a tower, I was like, well, what do I name this thing? Do I name it like Kingdom Tower? I, I just think it's so interesting to name like a, a, you know, a beautiful tower after a beautiful woman. I, I just, like, it's, it's just a marketing thing. And I guess I kind of realized that as I kind of went about creating Muse, like, or building things and naming things after Muses, that I thought it really improved the marketing of my art, its ability to inspire people's imagination, and it just brings a glamour and opulence and sex, sex appeal to something you design when you name something after a beautiful woman. And you don't just like paint some fantasy woman, but you paint a woman that actually exists. So for example, this woman here, I mean, she looks positively gorgeous here. I think Carly Kloss is the most beautiful woman we have a photographic record of. But, um, I, mean, she, I mean, look at her here. I mean, she just looks amazing. And um, I, I guess I just, I have a very muse-driven personality. Perhaps I didn't realize for a long time that that made me unique. That, I mean, not like <clears throat> designing something around a muse is terribly unique, but all my favorite painters, for example, like Thomas Kincaid and Stanley Kubrick, who was a painter, you know, in a way, in spite of him being a filmmaker, all my favorite painters weren't really terribly driven by muses. I am. I didn't really realize that until later on, um, that I just have a very muse-driven personality. I'm not someone who really likes painting themselves over and over and over again, like some paint, like some people who commission paintings or whatever. Like Michael Jackson loved to paint himself. He was a great painter in spite of him not really being seen as a painter. He understood painting. But, um, you, you know, I guess with every single painter that exists, you kind of see what their imagination is and um, like what makes them tick. And I guess for me, designing things around uses, perhaps in some ways to please them, um, you know, like I kind of get off on pleasing my muses or making something that makes them happy is a huge part of my own personal psyche. I, I it just took me a long time to realize that and understand myself that way. But um, let's just move forward. So... The term fragrance pharmacy, again, is not only a, a term that references that perfumes are drugs, but it, it kind of seems like I have two different names for my perfume company. It's like, why don't you just call your company fragrance pharmacy? Well, because fragrance pharmacy is really just a way of saying house of perfume. I actually might welcome other perfumes company, other perfumes com companies calling themselves fragrance pharmacies, like rather than calling them, you know, Carolina Herrera house of perfume or whatever. Um, there's all sorts of perfume companies out there. There's just an absurd number of them. And a lot of them like to call themselves House of Perfume. I just think that Fragrance Pharmacy is a more clever, clever alliteration way of saying House of Perfume. And it's also relevant because pharmacy, I mean, perfumes are drugs. Like, they, I don't know what to tell you. They are. 
And anybody who disagrees with that hasn't, doesn't understand evolution, doesn't understand their own brain, doesn't understand what perfume ingredients are. In many ways, I think that Zeus Muse, like all perfume companies, are kind of drug dealers. Like they sell drugs in the same way that Taco Bell is a drug dealer. Food is a drug. You receive dopamine releases when you eat food. Food doesn't naturally taste like anything. What tastes like something, what tastes like poop to us, probably tastes like ice cream to a fly. So what does that tell you? None of those sensations of what we see taste is real. It's just something that takes place in the brain. So, um, and I, I don't know, I could talk about this logo. I mean, this kind of can be summarized by, to be talked about by itself. But the lightning bolts, of course, it's a reference to Zeus. I just like the lightning bolt. I, I, I like to use symbols in my logos quite a bit. Um, in heart, you know, that's something that's, you see the heart used all the time in Valentine's stuff, but you don't see it done enough in logos. And I think you should see hearts more in logos than what you do. And not just in relation to some sort of Valentine's company or something like that. I mean, basically, you're, you're, I mean, you can put Microsoft in a heart. I mean, it's just a way of saying, like, I love tech. It's just a way of saying you love something. I mean, it's just a really effective tool to put a heart on something because it's like saying you will love our corporation or our corporation is to be loved. That's just kind of a way of saying that. You don't see that a lot in the corporate world. But I think it should be done more. So, um, yeah. Here, let's just move forward. But let's, um, I, I guess I'll just mention this. I've designed a lot of perfumes. I've des designed several perfumes for Carly. I think that, debatably, this is the best perfume that I've designed for Carly. Um, but I've designed other ones that are very, very different and very unique. And every single perfume that I design is different in color composition. Is different in the, in the ingredients that I select, is different in terms of the, the culture and brand, you know, the background and the perfume template, the painting. I want to create a painting for each one of my perfumes. Um, you may think from this here that I actually paint, this is just a draft. Um, this actually needs to be a giant cookie planet, but I'll get into that later on. Um, I don't paint. I, I can do a lot of stuff in CAD. I can do architecture, but there's a difference between being able to paint and being able to paint photorealistically. And a painter that I hire, I'm basically hiring them to paint something that looks like a photograph. And I don't have those skills to really execute that type of caliber of painting. I certainly have the, the caliber, the, the talent to lay it out. And I understand practically every painting concept that there is. And I'm really creative and I can problem solve. And a lot of different things that you need to be able to be good at in order to create a great painting. But I don't paint. So anyway. Um, I'm just, this slide is basically telling you, in spite of this entire presentation summarizing just one perfume with American Cookie, um, I've designed a lot of them. Um, but I guess when I started designing a lot of these perfumes, I was still learning. And although the perfume formulas between each perfume that I've designed is more or less identical, um, this presentation of this perfume template is obviously very visually clean, very visually beautiful. It's a very clever visual device. So it solves a lot of problems. I'll get into it later on. But the specificness of the details that differentiate it between this perfume and some that I designed earlier, the other ones that I designed, they're not as visually opulent. They're not as visually clean. It's not as pretty. It's just, you know, this thing down here with all the perfume ingredient genres is not fully developed yet. Just things like that, but the all in all, the formulas are more or less intact. So I'm hoping that I can be able to hire a team of kind of little Photoshop people. They don't have to be terribly skilled or anything, but to kind of relay in all these perfumes that I designed, so I don't have to do it myself because it just takes some time and I'm the greatest perfumer in the world, period. I, I don't, it confuses me when people say that I'm not just from my perspective at least, just because I understand what I bring to the table and I feel like I'm the greatest painter to ever go into perfume industry in spite of me not painting. I, I mean, this draft is impeccable and I have the ability to perfect it with my, you know, kind of directing painter skills. My perfume bottle is the best. My perfume template for laying out the ingredients is the best. My approach to every single aspect of perfumery, I feel, is unrivaled. So whether you're talking about quantity, quality, Anything you could analyze in terms of what I bring to the table as a perfumer, I am the best, okay? I, I, and I don't even have peers. 
well, I've just, I, I write screenplays. I've done a lot of different things art artistically. I have peers in other mediums. I do not have peers in perfumes. So we'll just move forward. The conventions of typical marketing is this. Pretty much you have the perfume bottle. I think mine's the best. This is just the concept art here. Uh, the real thing will actually, I think I want kind of red, white, and blue glass. And then this will kind of look like it's a painted glass type of thing. But it's essentially the size of a cupcake. I'm essentially taking House of Solange's perfume design and perfecting it. But the other designs that relate to the other perfumes, this one is different relative to the other ones. I'll get into that later on. But the convention is to have, you have the painting, the perfume, um, marketing artwork, kind of like a square or a magazine size page. And then you have the perfume bottle in the right hand corner with some sort of label on top of it like that. Um, this is actually kind of like a, a logo relative to the perfume. I think I'm probably going to do that with all my perfumes just because creating logos is not complicated. It's super easy to do and it adds, you know, culture and brand to the, to each perfume that is relevant. So, um, yeah, that, that's the perfume. There's never been a perfume template like this before that lays out all the perfume ingredients. You don't see a whole lot of ads like this. I'm not saying that this ad, this perfume template is utterly revolutionary. This ad, I think it's creative. It's fun. You know, I don't know. I just put it in there because I, I had, I, it's something that I could create without having to hire a painter and pay $3,000 or something like that to, to paint this painting. Whereas this, I can just put it together myself. I think it advertises um, the perfume really well. I don't really see it to be revolutionary. Um, it's creative, it's fun, it's interesting. I think it'll be reasonably effective. But this perfume template is, undoubtedly. It is, I, I've done a lot of the revolutionary things in terms of using real human ingredients and other things like that. A lot of things. But all in all, I'd say my most important innovation in perfume is probably this perfume template, simply because it can be used universally by posterity or current perfumers to really perfect their craft of creating a perfume. It's a really, really helpful tool, not only in terms of marketing the product, but also perfumers developing their own perfume. So um, let's just move forward. The three themes of this American cookie are this. Um, America, as you can see from the red, white, and blue composition of these frames around each perfume ingredient. Um, it's kind of, I, I don't know, it's not like uh, I had it in mind to have this Zeus Muse logo with the red, white, and blue coloring. It just sort of worked out that way just because I really like the color composition. Red, white, and blue is a really, really strong, effective color composition. You see it on a lot of flags of all sorts of countries from France to America to Great Britain, a lot, of, a lot of countries use red, white, and blue because they're so strong as colors collectively and even individually, you know, whether or not you mix them together and create some sort of design with red, white, and blue. They're just, it's, it's a really strong color composition. And I don't know, that's one of the reasons why I really like this perfume. As you can see, you kind of have the, the flag of the red, white, and blue built around in the perfume ingredient frames. Um, really clever visual device. Just a way of adding culture to each perfume ingredient relative to the brand. Even the Cookie Monster is blue, which is a, another aspect of this perfume brand cookies. These three top ingredients here are essentially cookie ingredients. I actually designed a perfume for Carly called K5, which stands for Cur Queen Carly's Coffee Cookie and Creams. I understand she wants to open a baking shop or some sort of shop for cookies because she, she's just a huge cookie fan. She had the show called Carly's Cookies. And the reason for the K here rather than the C I think it kind of makes it a little bit more difficult to read when you have the K here rather than the C. But Carly really likes the letter K being that her name is Carly Kloss. Um, she just likes the letter K. I like the letter K too, perhaps because I really like Carly. And she's, that letter has become more fond in my imagination simply due to her. I, she's just, you know, a, a big figure in my imagination. A, a tremendous opinion of her as, you know, a woman and a human being. So, um... And I guess Carly Kloss is kind of the last aspect of this perfume here. As you can see, you have the female ingredients. In spite of term ingredients like ovulation cream, breast milk, and sweat that's harvested when the woman is ov ovulating, which will make the, the sweat more attractive in, in terms of the way that the male or a male or males um, smells it and takes it in. But... Um, and you see these images of Carly here, but the ingredients are not necessarily, if you're talking about selling the prop, 
the product to the public relative to um, Carly. I think if you were to create a perfume for Carly personally, like what the like if Carly not only sells this perfume but wears it herself, I think it should have her real breast milk, her real ovulation cream, and real ovulation sweat. If she really wants to go all out and actually perfect her own product, just because she wants to wear a product, and it's just you know. People don't just like sell perfumes that are celebrities, but they wear them themselves. So, you know, for the same reason that anyone buys perfume, they just want to create something when they enter a room, everybody looks at them and they get attention and it just makes them more opulent. A lot of different things. There's a lot of reasons why people wear perfumes, but um, track to mate, all sorts of things. But um, the perfumes that are sold, like if this perfume is to be sold and it will be sold to the public, it's not going to have Carly's ingredients in them. Really, just because that's too expensive. That's simply simply what it is. I mean, trying, she's, I mean, Carly is like, you know, she is a milk factory. She makes sweat. She can make ovulation cream during that time of the month. And it's just not economically practical to try to create a perfume for, that's available to the public that has those ingredients. Now, you would have to create some sort of you know, system whereby you're, you know, having women, women harvest their own milk and put it in the perfume, but, or you could have the woman who actually buys the perfume, milk herself, send her breast milk to the company, then they put it in the perfume and then they send it back to them, which is a really clever idea, but I'll get into that later on. I didn't mean to get into that in this um, presentation of this slide here, but it is what it is. So we'll just move forward. But the three concepts of this perfume are America, Cookies, and Carly Kloss. She's the muse. America is the theme. It's really patriotic perfume. I think it's really hard to find a painting that is just more patriotically magnificent than this painting here. This is actually the racehorse secretary, the greatest racehorse of all time. And he was, well, I guess he wasn't like American. It's not like he had like a, um, you know, I mean, I guess he had American owners, but it's not like he has a, you know, some sort of driver's license that says he's American. I mean, I guess animals, they... I don't know, we'll just drop it. I think you understand what I'm saying, but it's just interesting to have this super, super American themed perfume with Carly riding the greatest American racehorse of all time. As you can see, you know, the this is not a high quality image just because I had to Photoshop this because he was an older horse. Well, not he wasn't older. He's dead now. So um, the photo that was taken was not Photoshopped from a great image and for that reason it's just not high quality but we'll move forward um the incomplete details of the american cookie draft i just sort of talked about some of those the paint the horse needs to be repainted i like the cobblestones here i don't know what you can really do to perfect that but this is actually going to be a red white and blues road filled with red white blue red white it's going to look magnificent i'm telling you and i'm a huge fan of thomas kincaid one of the things i learned from tim thomas kincaid is Always put flowers on your bushes. So these are going to have some sort of flowers on these bushes and trees here. These ballerinas, I mean, look at that fly. It's just amazing. But these ballerinas are going to be repainted, of course. I really like that. Just, I mean, that is a flag device. It's just positively brilliant. And um, the uh, planet Earth in the background is going to be replaced with kind of like this giant Earth-like cookie with like, you know, kind of like a chocolate chip thing with little chocolate chips here and there. I don't know, something like this. I mean, you could just put this in the background here, but it doesn't look realistic. I like to create paintings that look that don't, don't, don't go too far in the surrealism and always look at least somewhat realistic. So um, that's kind of what I'm going for in terms of the design for this earth background here. But really, really pleased with this painting and this draft. But um, to execute this painting without it degenerating from the draft, you'd have to hire a very talented painter that can kind of keep up with me. So um, the perfume bottle design, this is unique. And I talked about this earlier a little bit, but this, this cookie on the top is unique to the other, per to other perfumes that I designed. Other perfumes are actually going to have kind of this either gold, silver, or bronze metallic cap that has like a frites or a coin like top that takes an image, like a coin like image, puts it on the top of that perfume that is actually taken from this painting here. I You could just put an image of Carly on this coin as like you could have a gold cap with this image, like a circle image of Carly here on the gold cap. You could do that. 
but I just think that it's a little bit more interesting. It's still interesting the other way to have this cookie cap. It's just a little bit more clever. So for, this is the only perfume that I've designed that has this variation from the otherwise universal format of the perfumes. I think House of Solange is probably going to like try to take me to court, but I think I'll win the case just because I'm taking their design and drastically improving it and not just generating it. So, um, which is not usually the circumstance when you have people redo other existing artworks. They usually degenerate from the original classic, but I'm taking it and improving it. So, but again, the option between silver, bronze, and gold is all relative to what ingredients are selected for the perfume. Um, because real, the most expensive of perfume ingredients in the world is not perfume ingredients like ambergris, which comes from whales or jasmine or any other, you know, kind of perfume ingredient like that. But it's real obvious. It's like the real obvious. Well, I'll just say this specifically. The most expensive perfume ingredient in the world is probably Taylor Swift, Carly Gloucester, some of these super women's ovulation cream. Period. Um, most people probably can't even afford to put that type of ingredient in a perfume just because it's there's only so much of it. It comes from one individual person on the planet, and they might not want to give it up to begin with. So obviously that would that is the most expensive perfume ingredient. In the world, it's not ambergris, it's not any of these other ingredients that come from animals. It's the human ingredients, humans are animals too, that come from specific people. So, yeah. Um, here is the verbal ad, right here on the right, you see the American Cookie Perfume Verbal Ad. I don't know if I'm going to do this with all my perfumes. I just wrote it up and I'm like, oh, this is clever. I like it. You know, it's kind of like this girly interpretation of Carly kind of selling her product to the public and talking about all the individual perfume ingredients that are in the perfume. You have the color composition of the of, of red, white, and blue that kind of, well, it comes from the perfume ingredients. I selected red, white, and blue perfume ingredients for that reason. But um, I, I just think it's really clever. I think it'll sell stuff. Um, again, I don't think, I don't, think I'm going to use this on every single one of my perfumes that I design to market that perfume, but it is a really clever visual device. So I, I want to talk about this dress. I mean, I, this is actually Carly wearing the Hope Diamond here as a ring. Anyway, I just thought I'd mention that. Um, but uh, I like the frames here with the kind of, you can have one on, on her other side too. These floral frames are kind of like little bouquets that you could wear on your ankles. You could also wear them on your wrists. I mean, I just, I loved this dress. When I first saw it, I was, I just kept looking at it. It's just like, there's an endless number of photos of it and just thought it was the most beautiful dress I've ever seen. I thought Carly looked like the most beautiful woman that ever walked the planet that night. Um, by far her best dress that I've ever seen her wear. Sometimes she always looks great on the red carpet, but her dress is a little bit indifferent. But this dress was just magnificent and I feel like I came in and improved it. And um, I guess what I'm trying to bring to the table in the fashion industry, I mean, I guess perfumes is seen as part of the fashion and fashion industry is great, great works of art with great, great fashion pieces um, that have beautiful women. Most of the greatest painters and artists in the world don't work in the fashion industry. They just don't. Okay. Photography is a weaker medium than painting. You can't accomplish as much in it. And the artists that work in photography that are seen as great photographers are nowhere near as good as the painters. And artists like Boris Vallejo and Julie Bell, who I see to be the greatest painters, than both David Nordau, painters like that, um, they don't work in the fashion industry. And if they do, it's sparingly like based upon commission. And I think that's a mistake by the fashion industry not to hire those painters. Now, perhaps you could say that everybody, the real reason that people are looking at those fashion industries is because they're fascinated by, by that woman. They want to be with that woman. They wish that they were having, you know, whatever. But they wish that they were with that woman, and that's part of the fascination of why photography is now more popular than painting. But if you want to talk about the ability of the medium to express certain things and communicate ideas and paint things that aren't there, painting is a superior medium to photography, period. So anyway, I just, I just wanted to talk about this dress. I didn't talk about it. I love the frames on the shoulders here. I love for Carly to actually wear this dress again with my new additions, which I feel like drastically improve it. Again, I feel like it was one of the greatest dresses of all time, if not the greatest dress of all time. And I, I, I came in and improved it. <clears throat> I feel like that's one thing that I'm really good at doing is taking really great works of art and finding ways to improve it. Um, with other inferior works of art, I don't even mess around with trying to improve them. But when it's a great work of art, I've, most of the time I can improve it unless you're talking about like a Thomas Kincaid painting 
which is really just hard to improve. And at the same time, Thomas Kincaid, again, I'm unique in the sense that I like to paint muses. He never did portraits, so I don't look at his paintings and try to be like, oh, what if it was this painting with Carly or with Taylor or with Ariana or some one of my other muses? And, you know, I kind of use this frame, but I change this and change that and put this here and put this there. You can't really do that with a Thomas Kincaid, but all in all, I'd say Tom. It's kind of difficult to know where to begin when it comes to summarizing this bottom area of this perfume template. Just because so much thought has been gone has gone into act, to formulating the final product of categorizing perfumes by genre. It's been done a lot of different times. I don't know if it's ever been done this formulaically of actually breaking it down relative to you know some perfume template that relates to every single perfume that you design. But in spite of it perhaps not being definitive in terms of how many perfumes you should select, perfume genres you should select for the entirety of perfumes. Um, so for example, you could break it down into five genres. Originally there was just eight genres, but as I continue developing and thinking about how I should categorize perfumes by genre, it broke out into finally 15 different genres. So I still feel like it's, it's the best way of doing it. And if you're also talking about the best way to categorize perfumes by genre relative to this scale of pluses for women and negatives for men. Not to say that a male perfume is negative, it's just a way of kind of quantifying with a mathematical analytical system how perfume ingredients should fit into this scale of masculine and feminine in general. I'm, I think that there are still strong variations in terms of some floral perfumes being more feminine than others. But at the same time, I also have this Louvre perfume genre, which is represented by this icon of lavender. Also, you have like tobacco in this category. And um, what are some other ones? Um, I don't know. There's other ones. But like patchouli, patchouli also falls in this category. There's a whole bunch of them. There's definitely more floral perfumes that are kind of classically floral. But there are some flowers out there that are kind of masculine. So I created this love category. And, you know, a lot of people would perhaps throw oud or agar wood in the wood category, but oud is more technically kind of a fungus. And I would say that funguses are probably a little bit more masculine per se than let's say a wood. You do see oud in some feminine perfumes, but it's kind of like a, you know, a kind of a rough strong woman kind of a vibe rather than a really delicate feminine floral fragrance to add an ingredient like oud to a female perfume. The same can be said of leather, which is one of these hunt categories. Basically any, any sort of hunt, hunt perfume category is something where you have to kill the animal in order to acquire the perfume ingredients. So leather, you, I mean, there's a bajillion different types of leather out there because there's a bajillion different types of animals, all of which have different types of different smelling leather. Um, ambergris falls in this category, Cast castorium, deer musk, a lot of things fall in this category. Most of these, well, there, there really isn't any strong masculine perfume ingredient that is in this specific American cookie perfume. Why? Well, because it's, a, I mean, for someone like Taylor Swift, who definitely has some masculine qualities, you might want to put a, something like leather in one of her perfumes or something like that. I don't actually, I've designed several perfumes for Taylor, but... Leather is not one of her ingredients in any of her perfumes. Maybe I should change that, but I mean, it's kind of fitting in some ways for her, but um, for Carly, no, I don't think it's fitting to have leather in her perfume just because firstly, leather is kind of a masculine thing and Carly is just a really girly, sweet woman. I wouldn't say delicate, but she's definitely a strong woman, but she's, she's, she's just really sweet. And I don't know if leather is really fitting for her unless she came up with a brand concept that somehow allowed for leather to be appropriate relative to the, 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 the 12 perfumes that were selected for per, her perfume. But there's a lot to say about this perfume genre breakdown down here. And um, one of the reasons I have the icons here and then the labels and stuff like that is so that I can actually implement the icon relative to each individual perfume genre. So as you can see, every single one of these 12 perfume ingredients has an icon at the bottom base of each perfume frame, and that's to identify what genre it is specific to. Um, 
I mean, some of the perfume ingredients that I was originally not super familiar with, I mean, I suppose every single perfume ingredient on this list I was familiar with before. I mean, most people are familiar with all these ingredients. I mean, who doesn't, who isn't familiar with blueberries? Everybody knows what a blueberry is, at least Americans. I mean, maybe if you go to India, they don't really make blueberries or put blueberries in grocery stores or have, they, I don't know if they have grocery, they probably do. I don't know. I've never been to India, but um, most of these perfume ingredients people are all familiar with, but for other ingredients that you're not familiar with, like ambergris or civet or Kopi Luwak or, or, um, frangipani or lang lang there's there's a bajillion perfume ingredients out there but for some of them that there are ingredients it's, it's helpful to know you can probably tell what type of ingredient it is just by looking at it so for example if you look at ambergris well no that's not a good example at all if you look at frangipani you'll recognize that it's a flower but ambergris you're not even sure what the hell that is by looking at it they didn't when they first discovered ambergris they didn't even know what it was and then it wasn't until later on that they realized it was a, you know, a, a substance that was secluded by whales. I think it's sperm whales and then from their intestines or something. Um, but um, it's helpful to have the genre labeled on each perfume, perfume genre. And it's also helpful to know, well, how masculine and feminine is this perfume? Because some women, every woman is different. As much as women definitely have variations relative to men, there are certain qualities that are, you know, seen as being feminine and women when they're buying a perfume they probably are you know thinking about well okay how masculine versus feminine is this perfume like where do i want my perfume genres to have the highest percentage in it you know how how feminine do i want my perfume um for some women that really like the strong woman type of appeal they might want some black powder in there which is a boom ingredient or some leather in there or maybe some oud which is an also a male ingredient I wouldn't go all out and add all those ingredients for a woman, or I don't know if I'd recommend it, but if they want kind of a strong woman type of a vibe, you can kind of add some of those ingredients sparingly to get the effect that you want in terms of coming off the, in a way that you think fits you. So, or like fits your mood or fits your day or, uh, for someone like Taylor Swift who's so dynamic, I mean, you almost need like 10 different perfumes to based upon what type of vibe she's going for or whatever. She's just a very dynamic person, but, um, I don't know. I mean, at, at here at the bottom, you see the number of perfume ingredients that are relative to each. So here you see three. Now, what does that mean? That means that there are three female or Hera perfume ingredients. So you have the ovulation sweat, the breast milk, and the ovulation cream. So three. Here you have two perfume ingredients right here in the flora. That means that you have two floral ingredients. So the JFK rose and the Mr. Lincoln rose. But these perfumes are not balanced all proportionally. So as you can see, there's a 19% for the JFK Rose, but there's only 2% ovulation sweat, which perhaps should be even lower just because it's hard. It's really hard to actually harvest the sweat from a woman, specifically even more hard when there's a timetable as to when you are to harvest that sweat. And then when you're talking about harvesting ovulation cream, it's even more difficult but the reason that I, you know, added per human perfume ingredients like ovulation cream and breast milk, breast milk is actually pretty, I mean, women, they're like milk factories. I mean, they're dairy cows if, if, if they allow themselves to be. I don't know the specifics of how a woman can get herself to lactate, but like apparently you just tug on the nipple and it, or it depends on their hormone. I don't know. I don't have boobs. So it's, I don't, I'm not familiar with those things in the way that a woman is and don't really know the parts of a tampon and, and things of that nature. But um, I added these ingredients like ovulation cream kind of just to give you a look. Like if, if you're really trying to create an aphrodisiac that really is an aphrodisiac, you undoubtedly need ovulation cream. I mean, you hear all the time, it's like, well, what's a stronger aphrodisiac? What's a better aphrodisiac? What's a better aphrodisiac? Like every single perfumer is talking about how much of a aphrodisiac their perfume is. Like chocolate's an aphrodisiac. Well, it is in some ways, but it's not in the same way that ovulation cream is. It's not something that when you smell it, you want to get down and fornicate or whatever, or have sex or whatever. It's it's not the same. So I'm just I'm just trying. Like not only do I think that if you really were to try to pull off what is seen as a real, real aphrodisiac, you undoubtedly need the human ingredients. So we'll get into a little bit more of that later on. But for now, 
just be aware that there's a lot more than meets the eye with these perfume ingredients. I've thought them out. I was going to write like a 200 page book on it, but I, I don't really have a desire to be a scholar. I'm a businessman. And that's kind of why this lecture has been put together is so that I don't, I can kind of summarize something quickly without having to lay out a book and write it. It just, it's just not, it doesn't take as long to just talk about something improvisationally as it does to actually systematically write about something in a way that's in a publishable, publishable format. Symmetry of design. As you can see, the perfume, the perfume painting is very symmetrical. I don't know, this perfume bottle is symmetrical. I, I just, I love symmetry. I'm, I'm obsessed with symmetry in everything I do. Um, I'm obsessed with the number 12. As you can see, there are 12 perfumes, perfume ingredients that are, are placed in each one of my perfumes that I've designed. But as you can see, there is also a symmetry in relationship to how I lay out the perfume ingredients. So you have chocolate in the center, which is a, um, well, it's kind of a food, it's kind of a sugar, could be a spice. I put it in the sugar category just because I did. I could, I could have put it in either one of those categories if I wanted to. But the two spices, which are kind of relative to the cookie theme of the perfume, are placed horizontally in relationship to another. Frankincense and myrrh, which are always thought of being, you know, thought of in a similar light, not only because they're both resins or both woods or come from woods, um, they're resins that come from woods, um, but they're placed symmetrically in relationship to one another. The two fruits are placed symmetrically to one another. The two, the ovulation cream and the, and the sweat are, are placed in relationship to one another. The breast milk, well, there's, there was nothing to place symmetrically in relationship to um, breast milk. I could have put it like a breast milk here and a breast milk here, and then it's like two tits. I like doing stuff like that just because I think it's interesting, but I didn't end up doing that. But the, again, the two roses, symmetrical. I love symmetry. I love laying things out in a way that comp comprehensively makes sense so that it's easier to look at the perfume and take it in. And as you can see, again, the two, the three cookie perfume ingredients are at the top. You kind of have the fruit ingredients here, the floral ingredients that are at the bottom, the woman ingredients that are at the bottom. There's just the impeccable layout of the, of the presentation of this perfume plan template is just there's nothing else like it. It's I, I put a, but it's not just this perfume. I do it to all my perfumes. I'm always attentive to symmetry of placement of perfume genres. So, so it's like a, you know, a symmetry of concepts in a lot of ways. So color composition. I've already talked about this, but we have the red, white, and blue color composition. Again, you have the blue over here because you have the American flag with the blue, blue over here. Kind of emulates a flag a little bit with this layout with kind of the red and white stripes as well. Really like that. Um, I'm all my perfume. I wish I could give some examples. I'm, I, I don't know. That's why I attached my perfume Bible at the end of this presentation for you to read if you want to read through it. It's not. I, I'd say watching this video is more entertaining, but that's that could be entertaining too. It's just not quite as entertaining. I don't know. I just personally think that listening to someone talk about something I will always take over actually reading a book. But that's just me. Some people would just always gravitate towards reading just let me read it you know but whatever um but um all my perfumes have different color compositions so for example little Nas sexes taste the rainbow perfume has a red here red orange here orange yellow green blue purple it's just it's it's a visual display of all the colors of the color wheel and then you have fruit from each color of the color wheel wrap around this frame which is one of the reasons why i love the number 12 is because the color wheel breaks down evenly on the number 12 because you have red, orange, yellow, green, blue, purple, and then you have red, orange, orange, yellow, yellow, green, green, blue, blue, purple, purple, red. It just, from a mathematical perspective, the color wheel breaks down evenly on the numbers three, six, and 12 based upon the foundation of three primary colors. And I just like doing things in 12. I'm obsessed with the number 12 primarily for color application purposes. It's no incident or accident that this ended up being a numerical comp composition of 12 perfume ingredients. I just love it. The number 12 is also super divisible, so it's always symmetrical, it's not an odd number. It's just, it's a really it's really helpful to design things around the number 12. I know this is color composition category, but, and I'm talking about numbers, but um, they're interrelated. So, <clears throat> how I systematically label each perfume. I've already kind of talked about that, but here you have always, you always have the perfume ingredient here, right in this slot, right in this slot, right in this slot. And here you kind of have some sort of advertising phrase 
she's just myrrh. So Frank, me, me adding frankincense and myrrh to this perfume, it's like, well, how the hell is that relevant to a red, white, and blue American cookie themed perfume? Well, I add frankincense and myrrh to all my perfumes. Again, because I have a muse-based personality, I love creating things for muses. I get off on creating things for someone that interests me, someone that fascinates me, and have them love it. Like that's that's something that really pleases my psyche. So I kind of see myself as having a bit of a Santa personality, um, in the sense that I like giving gifts to people that inspire my imagination. And I think that frankincense and myrrh kind of personifies that because the the tale of you know the three wise men brought gifts of frankincense and myrrh to baby Jesus, and that's kind of what I'm trying to suggest with my perfumes. So each one of each one of my perfumes, I try to put frankincense and myrrh in. Now there's only three percent of myrrh and three percent of frankincense, as opposed to nineteen percent for the, each of the roses. But I like to add frankincense and myrrh, even if it's not directly appropriate to the perfume ingredient, because it's not only something that reflects me personally, but it's like a brand thing. Like there's always the scent of frankincense and myrrh on a Zeus Muse perfume. It's just a branding thing. Like there's, it's like having a calling card in your perfume formula fragrance way of going about creating a perfume. I just think that's clever to do. And that's why I did it. The layout of the per 15 perfume ingredients. I've already talked about that. I like doing things, and I'm obsessed with the color wheel, obsessed with the number of I tried to put 12 perfume ingredients. Unfortunately, due to what I discovered in terms of labeling the perfume ingredients, specifically as it relates to identifying perfume ingredients relative to masculine and feminine and giving them a score, it just proved kind of impossible to do. So I broke it down in 15 perfume ingredients. Here we have the, the Zeus, which is male-based perfume ingredients, which is pretty much just male sweat, like LeBron James putting his... Sweat in a perfume is kind of a way of wearing his profession on his sleeve. And if you could think, if you think about like if he harvested his sweat during the next NBA champ, I don't know if he's going to win another NBA championship. He's like 37 now. But if Michael Jordan, for example, harvested his sweat during one of his NBA finals and put that in the perfume, people would kind of be interested in smelling. It's like putting victory in a perfume. And I think Michael would think that was cool. Unfortunately, he's past his playing age, so his scent has lost a lot of its youthful vigor in terms of how I think a female will smell it and feel attracted to him. But at the same time, he's also lost the opportunity to actually harvest his sweat during an NBA championship. So he loses the ability to kind of create a victory based perfume. I really like Michael Jordan. I'm just, I'm just trying to explain to you what you can do with a, adding sweat to a perfume. I, do I think that it's appropriate for someone like Bill Gates to add his sweat to a perfume? Well, perhaps not. He's, he's older. He's not as, you know, he's probably not as musky as he was in his youth. And exertion, you're, you know, sweating is not part of his profession. Or someone like Michael Jordan or an athlete, I mean, that's kind of the smell of his profession. It's like wearing your profession as a fragrance. So we'll move forward. Boom is, there's really only one ingredient that I fit in here. I thought about putting rocket fuel in a, in a Elon Musk perfume, but unfortunately, people feel sick when they smell rocket fuel. So I didn't do that. But on the other hand, black powder, which I think is kind of an exciting fragrance that smells like the holidays, like 4th of July, and it's exciting and it's fun. I don't see it as a negative fragrance. It's, I still see it as a masculine fragrance because it's kind of the, like, you know, historically the smell of black powder is kind of the smell of a battlefield, you know, in death. But it's it, in the modern sense, it's kind of an exciting smell. But, you know, to a Marine or someone, it's kind of the smell of death which is why I put it in the masculine category as opposed to hunt, which is basically just, I've already talked about this a little bit, but like castorium, civet, um, ambergris, any type of leather, and basically any type of, you know, thing that you harvest from an animal where you have to kill it in order to wear it. Um, we are animals. We are carnivores. We, you know, the reason we make meat taste good to us as a species is because millions of our, all the way down to bacteria, we have been killing and eating animals for millions of years, and that's not gonna change anytime soon. So we are carnivores, that's just a part of who we are as a species. Um, I'm just calling it as I see it. And if you were to wear like lion musk as a perfume, like that's interesting. I mean, you may say that's like kind of animal cruelty or whatever, but I don't know, I eat meat. I feel bad for animals, but I really like the taste of meat. I mean, it's like if, it, if it's so bad, why does it taste so good and you know feel so good when I taste it? So um, I don't know. 
but let's just move forward. Fungus, there's a, there's not that many fungus perfume ingredients. Oud is probably one of the most famous perfume ingredients in the world, outside of the rose, of course, which is used as much in the floral industry as in perfumery. But um, I, I think that a fungus is a little bit more masculine, all in all, than a wood, but not quite as masculine as, let's say, leather. Depends on what type of animal you're killing. Sometimes livestock doesn't, we don't really associate it as kind of rawness of nature. But if you came out of a forest smelling like deer musk from the musk from the, the deer that you killed, that's kind of a mask. You smell like a hunter or something. Like that's interesting. So Louvre, I've already talked about this. It's like lavender patchouli. Um, basically any type of masculinely themed perfume ingredient that um, is not if it's a flower that doesn't smell feminine. So spice, in a lot of ways, people kind of see spice like adding spearmint, peppermint, and, you know, and ginger and dark chocolate. People think that's kind of a food. I mean, why do you think I only gave it a negative one as opposed to a negative seven for the, the Zeus or Boom or Hunt category? Um, well, that's because it's kind of a general neutral perfume ingredient, but I'd say all in all, Spices are a little bit more prevalently used for male perfumes than female. Not to say that a, a woman can't, you know, if she had a home sweet home, which is a perfume that was on home, home sweet home, a perfume ingredient made up of all these spicy holiday perfume ingredients. You know, in some ways, a perfume that is just, just those spice ingredients is kind of a feminine perfume, but I don't know. It's debatable where this should go. In some ways, it, should, it might even be in the zero category. It's all relative to each ingredient and then how you, what other ingredients that you select around those spices. But all in all, I feel I got it right. So we'll just leave it. Food, I don't think, like, I mean, is chicken, I, mean, I don't know, chicken is actually a hunt category, I guess. But an apple, oh, that's a fruit category. I'm trying to think of what thing falls in the fruit category, like a nut. I mean, what is a nut mas is an almond masculine or feminine or a pistachio or you know, like grain is, is, is a grain like, like, uh, adding oats to a perfume, which is something that I did to LeBron James. I added oats to his perfume because he eats oats with every single meal that he eats. And I thought it was appropriate to add oats to his per personal cologne that reflected the diet that he eats, which is a part of his profession and success in the world is, you know, what he eats. That's a huge part of kind of how he's able to be such a specimen at such an age is he eats well. He's very careful of what he eats. So sugar, that's kind of a one perfume note. There's only one thing that falls in that category, citrus. I don't really need to explain that, but I think that citrus is a little bit more masculine than fruit. I don't know. I like adding citrus more to, to perfumes than I do regular fruits, just because it has a more zesty, spicy quality. It wakes you up more. It makes you feel more invigorated. Whereas fruit doesn't do that quite as much, which is why I don't add it as much, but it's still a perfume ingredient that I use, that I use in this perfume, primarily because I couldn't add, there, there's no spices or, or there's no citrus fruits that are red or blue in color. And I wanted a red or blue fruit. That was one of the requirements of the, this position here is it had to be blue and it had to be red. So I selected a red apple and a blue fruit here, but um, honey, a lot of people think that, well, I don't know if a lot of people, but there's as many types of honey out there in the world as there are plants. There are a million types of honey. So what is honey? Honey is essentially harvested flowers by bees. It's like, I, I don't want to relate it to poop because it's not poop. It's, it, it's kind of, let me get ready to this. It's like flower milk for bees. That's kind of what it is. I mean, for us, we make milk to feed our babies Bees make, eat their food and make honey to feed their children. It's the same thing. But being that there's all types of bees out there, but particularly there's so many different types of flowers that they're harvesting and plants that they're harvesting this honey from. There's a million types of honey, million types of honey. So puppy, I actually added puppy breath in a few of my perfumes. You could add babies. Babies have a smell. Certain mothers love the smell of their babies. I mean, of course they love their babies. I think if Carly added the smell of her baby to her perfume, she'd probably like that. I don't know if she would want to do that. She doesn't really like to show images of her baby. She's very protective of her child, which is, you know, a very great motherly quality that she has. But I just wanted to show what type of ingredients you could add to a perfume. I have not designed a perfume that has baby scent in it. I have designed a perfume that has puppy scent in it. 
I just, I guess what you see here with the baby face and the pup perfume label is kind of a way of kind of mixing those two, two, two together so that you kind of understand what they are. I don't know. In some ways, this could kind of be eliminated as a category, but if you're to, you know, account for every single perfume ingredient that could be included in a perfume, in spite of floral ingredients being used a thousand times more than, let's say, puppy breath, I think they should be used. I really like adding puppy breath. I love the smell of puppies. It smells like new life, and I, I just, I, I just love the smell of puppies. I like, I grew up with dogs, and they have several litters of puppies growing up. I just like the smell of puppies, and I think it's interesting to add the smell of a puppy to a perfume. I don't know what kittens smell like. I've actually never even held a kitten, but I don't know if I've even seen a kitten. Anyway, but yeah, I've never even, not that I'm against, I'm slightly allergic to cats, but I've never even seen a kitten, much less held one. So, which is odd, but <laughs> um, um, flower, per, flower perfume, that doesn't really need to be explained. There's a million types of flowers. Obviously, that's a plus six category. Some perfumes are more feminine or some flowers are more femininely scented than others, but whatever. And I, I think that this is just my opinion. Ovulation cream is more feminine than jasmine, which is probably the most feminine flower in the world. Um, what I, what do I think men would be more receptive to smelling and getting excited about and wanting to smell on you? Ovulation cream or jasmine? Ovulation cream. It's not even close. It's not even close. Not even close. Okay. I mean, if a man knew that, I mean, I, it's kind of like false advertising when you're wearing ovulation cream in your in your own personal perfume. Breast milk, not as much. I mean, if, it, if your breast milk is harvested and there, I mean, a lot of people may say, well, like, how do you harvest breast milk? Well, then how do you preserve it? Well, Every single one, perfume ingredient is an organic material that has to be preserved. And if you can preserve a rose, you can preserve breast milk. And they have ways of preserving breast milk, so I'm not concerned about it, nor am I concerned about concerning sweat or ovulation cream. Those can all be preserved. On the other hand, sperm, which is something that you could add to a male perfume, really can't be preserved because it is actually a living organism inside that perfume ingredient that you're trying to preserve, and it just can't be done. The other perfume essential oils will kill it, and it would have to be at a certain temperature all the time. It's not possible. I would wish you could do it because most women are aroused by the smell of sperm, which makes sense over the course of millions of years of evolution. Evolution is trying to get that woman to reproduce and have as many positive mental associations with male anatomy as possible within reason because they're still looking for other attributes for a healthy mate. But um, women are aroused by the smell of sperm just like men are aroused by the smell of when she's wet, and they've done research on that, to, to men are aroused by the smell of when she's ovulating, you know, her, she smells, but her sweat smells better when she's ovulating, all sorts of things, but you cannot put sperm in perfume, I wish that you could, you just can't do it, so, Hera um, is the last perfume ingredient here, I've already discussed these quite a bit, and I, I, it's actually a category later on, but I've kind of discussed them relatively sufficiently. We'll see what I get, what I summarize when we actually get to that slide, but let's just move forward. Evolution is the origin of all drug effects. That's true. And, you know, I don't, you kind of have to go through each category and explain that. But, um, you know, again, um, what does ice cream taste like to us? Taste like ice cream tastes really sweet and exciting and yummy. And you feel your brain feels pleasure when you eat ice cream. But what does poop taste like? Oh, it's I, I've never tasted poop. I have no desire to taste poop, but I'm sure it tastes positively disgusting from its smell, which causes me to stay away from it, which is why the evolution instinct is there. You, you are wired to smell poop and feel revolted because it's trying to get you to stay away from eating it because you can get all sorts of dis, like viruses and there's all sorts of bacteria in there and just all sorts of nasty shit and, and poo and shit. So... Um, Everything that smell that exists, whether it's positive or negative, is trying to get you to, to, to go towards it or move away from it. The same is equally true of looking at a beautiful woman and wanting to get close to her and, you know, and, you know, have sex with her or whatever. It's the same thing. Evolution is trying to get you to reproduce with the best possible mate that you that you can have access to. And every single road, like this is the one exception that I have. This is the only exception as to why perfume ingredients smell good relative to the human mating ritual. Flowers smell good primarily to entice bees 
to pollinate. It's kind of it's kind of a mystery. Why do flowers smell good? Like, uh, they're, while they're trying to get bees to pollinate, they're not trying to get us to pollinate. But at the same time, flowers are not super hot on some of the flowers that we love to smell. But some of the flowers that they love, we can't even smell. So it's really just kind of a side effect that we can smell flowers at all because flowers are trying to get bees to pollinate. And we smell them as a kind of a byproduct of the smells that they're trying to create to get a bee to replicate. Now, I, I guess what that means is that some of our olfactory sexual reproductive or just sense of smell is somewhat similar to that of a bee, which is kind of weird. But I guess a lot of that, you know, I don't know, a dog likes smelling an ovulating human female more than any other time of period. So I guess a lot of the smells that relate to other animals relate to us too, in spite of none of those smells actually existing. Just some things are universal, I guess. I don't, I don't know how to fully label it. I know that some um, flowers are trying to entice male bees, but most of the pollinating that is done by bees is done by the females. So I don't know. It, it's, it's kind of a mystery to me why flowers smell good, why they even have some a, kind of an erotic quality, you know, you know, that wakes you up. You kind of feel butterflies with a really strong sensual floral fragrance. I personally prefer the smell of floral fragrances to woods just because I like smelling a woman. Now, would I want to wear jasmine as one a perfume ingredient? No, because that's just not of how I see myself or how I want to be seen or something that I'm using to attract a female that I want. But I'm more attracted to, to feminine fragrances for sure than I am to male fragrances. But what would I want to wear a female fragrance? No. So a lot, as much as people say, well, you know, people are trying to wear perfumes as like an extension. For, that may be true some of the time, but most of the, all of the conventions built around why people wear perfumes is built around the human mating ritual. So um, and now I'm going to discuss the perfume ingredients individually. Um, why did I add spearmint, dark chocolate, and ginger to Carly Kloss's American Cookie Perfume? Well, that's probably because I'm, I'm trying to create the cookie fragrance. I like mint. I was going to add – Carly likes a wide cava clade of cookie ingredients. She's a cookie fanatic. She has a very earthy – spice baker taste palette. She just loves earthy, tasty, tasty things for her. Post Malone likes chicken, likes carbs, likes junk food, likes candy. You know, perhaps I like those things too, but Carly really doesn't eat that type of stuff. So it was really easy for me to design a perfume around here for her relative to selecting these cookie perfume ingredients. The difficult thing was selecting which of the specific perfume ingredients do I add. Do I add pumpkin here because Carly loves pumpkin? Do I add spearmint? She loves spearmint gum. Do I add um, – what's another What's another thing she likes? I'm trying to think offhand. I mean I, I read some of her stuff and like her favorite foods. There was there was another one I'm thinking of. It, was, it wasn't pumpkin. It was – I don't know. Not Meg. I don't know. She likes a wide range of cookie ingredients. But I added spearmint primarily because I didn't like pumpkin. I'm not a huge fan of pumpkin. I'm not a huge fan of ginger either. Last time I had a ginger cookie, I spit it out. But she loves ginger. Ginger cookies are her favorite type of cookie. And I'm not just creating a perfume that I, of like I'd like to smell on Carly, but a perfume that she would like and she would want to wear. And she's just like, mm, this smells so good. I like because she likes ginger smells. I mean, obviously, a woman who loves ginger and loves ginger cookies is going to love the smell of ginger on her own perfume. So it was it was really just a matter of having ten different possible cooking ingredients, just selecting three of them. I selected dark chocolate because Carly prefers dark chocolate over chocolate. I'm more of a milk chocolate fan myself, but you know, it's Carly's perfume. It's not mine. So um, why did I add apple? Oh, this is the next slide. Frankincense and myrrh. I've already talked about this. Uh, I added frankincense and myrrh simply because of the Jesus type of thing where it's a muse or a Zeus giving something to a muse and kind of it's like that it's kind of showing the act of gift giving between you know myself and a muse as well as um, which is a huge part of this company. I don't design perfumes that don't have a muse. There's always someone that I'm designing a perfume around. But um, there's also the branding thing too of every single one of my perfume having at least some slight scent 
of frankincense and myrrh just because that's part of the Zeus Muse perfume brand. Um, blueberry and apple. I added out, I, I wanted to have cherry here, but Carly maybe likes cherries, but I couldn't find anything online about her eating cherries all the time. Perhaps because cherries are, I love, I prefer the taste of cherries to an apple, but what do I eat more? Apples, because they're just easier to eat. They last forever. They, you know, they always taste good. You know, they can be out for a month, depending on what brand you're buying. Apparently, Cosmic Crisp Apples, which is an apple I've thought about putting here because it's also a red apple. It's a great tasting apple, really big. It's genetically engineered, but it lasts three months outside of fridge. I mean, that's crazy. But apples are just a super hardy fruit that lasts a long time. It's kind of like a super fruit. If there ever was a super fruit, it would probably, in my opinion, be the apple. But Carly, it's apparently her go-to fruit, just like Tom Brady likes bananas as his go-to, um, per, you know, fruit that he eats. I designed a perfume called Banana Babe for Tom Brady because he loves bananas and because he calls all his friends babe. Apparently that's what I heard in an interview with Rob Gonkowski. I've never heard him say that, but apparently that's what he calls his teammates. So I designed the perfume Banana Babe for him. Anyway, I added the real reason that I added the fruits here, I could have added another perfume ingredient, or another cookie ingredient. I didn't end up doing that. Maybe I should have, but I wanted to add a red, white, and blue, you know, kind of quality. I wanted this to actually be red. I wasn't able to pull that off just because there wasn't another American rose that was red in color. So I just added the white rose. It was it works okay because I wanted the rose to. I didn't want a yellow rose for sure. Um, even though there's a lot of really fragrant yellow roses out there, but I added this one just because. I don't know. It's it's white. It doesn't quite fit, but it's an American rose and red, white, and blue. It's not perfect, but it still fits. But um, I really like selecting perfume ingredients that match the color of the frame, the perfume frame around it. I just like doing that. So if I have a perfume template concept of, of colors, I like to select perfume ingredients that match the color. So um, why did I add ovulate, ovulating sweat to Carly's perfume? Well, because um, I, I don't know. I think if you're talking about any like major league woman out there, if I think men look forward to being able to identify their scent. I mean, if, I don't know. It's it's int there's two different things here you're talking about. You're talking about adding female sweat to a perfume, sweat that isn't even yours, that's taken from another healthy female, that's part of Zeus Muse Company, versus a woman wearing her own sweat that's harvested when she's ovulating, taking a shower and then spraying her sweat scent back on. So she showers to feel clean because she wants to feel clean. But then she puts her own scent back on just because that's kind of a part of who she is. That's part of how she smells. I'm embracing who I am as a person. And a lot of, I don't know, I don't, I personally think that I wouldn't think Carly's scent smells bad. But a lot, I think that beauty is in the eye of the, the opposite sex more so than, um, you know, how you view yourself. So if you think you smell bad, well, that's because you're heterosexual and you're attracted to the opposite sex. Most women smell a healthy, strong, fit male and feel aroused and attracted. Well, I don't know, but aroused, slightly aroused at least, or at least kind of more in the mood to get to know the male. Um, and the same kind of applies to men when they smell women, specifically when they're ovulating, ovulating, and they've done studies to prove that. Why did I add breast milk to the perfume? I'm, I'm telling you, if Taylor Swift put her breast milk in her perfume, or Ariana Grande, or Dua Lipa, or Carly put her breast milk in every single man, and when they walked into, when she walked into a room, every single man in that room would want to smell her. Because I mean, when women wear all these, I mean, look at this outfit here, it shows off her breasts. Because, you know, breasts are a part of what excite men. It's a part of her feminine beauty. She's showing off her fertility. Um, it's, it's, it's what men are attracted to female physical reproductive beauty. Why are men attracted to, to women when they can do the splits? Because women who can do the splits are more likely not to die, die in childbirth. We, we, evolution took place where women were dying all the time in childbirth. So a woman, like my, a man doesn't have the problem of, of having to actually physically make the child. The woman physically makes the child. And for that reason, she has to be healthier physically than the male because she actually makes the child. I mean, it's kind of ironic that the, the woman kind of has to be physically healthier to make the child than the male. 
but yet at the same time, the male is generally stronger and fitter than the female, at least as a, like, as a sex. Men, men are stronger than females. But yet it's, it's ironic that the woman who actually has to physically make the child is weaker. It's just kind of ironic. But, um, yeah, I mean, I'll, I, I mean, men like breasts. I'm telling you, men love breasts. I look at those things and, yeah, they look gorgeous. But um, if you could actually wear that as a scent, it's kind of like, wearing a skimpy outfit without wearing a skimpy outfit because the women women love attention from men women love when you know they they're dressed looking like a queen and men kind of check out their boobs they, they act like they don't like it but they, they like it you know i mean it depends on the male that's checking them out but they get an ego boost out of it, it makes them feel stronger it makes them feel you know more powerful in the world and that's kind of something that you can do with adding breast milk to a perfume and unlike wearing ovulation cream, which is kind of like cheat codes for trying to attract men, um, breast milk, it's kind of like advertising your own personal fertility. Specifically, if you actually harvest your own breast milk and send it into the company to put it into your perfume. But I'm telling you, if a, if a man is attracted to you and you know he thinks your boobs look beautiful um, and he knows that your scent, you're wearing a perfume that has your breast milk in it, he will, he, he'll want to smell you. I'm telling you, he will want to smell you. And it's just, I mean, men love everything about breasts. I'm telling you, I don't know what it is, but <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. So, and another thing that you can do with adding your breast milk to a perfume, perhaps breast milk doesn't have a very strong fragrance, but when you mix that breast milk smell and they just know that your breast milk is in the perfume and you mix it with roses and with blueberries and frankincense and spearmint and dark chocolate, it's kind of like putting all sorts of cherries and toppings and you know spices on top of the fragrance of your breast milk so that you seem even more fertile and even sexier. So it's it's just something you, I mean, you could do the same thing with, like if you made a, like, like if you had a gift for a boyfriend and um, like you, you made, you, you harvested your breast milk, turned it into one of those fluffy whip things and put it in a can and gave it to him and put some like cherries in there as an added flavor, it would make your breast seem more than more, I don't know, I just think that would be such an interesting gift to do. You don't see our species really eating or drinking breast milk as adults. It's just kind of weird that we drink another animal's milk all the time. I mean, a lot of people wonder why people break out why when they eat dairy, and that's because you're eating another animal's milk. You know, if, I, I don't think that the same problems of skin complexion and breaking out will exist with drinking breast milk. I, there's nothing to prove that, but I, I would speculate that that's true. I don't know that for sure, but it's just, I mean, a lot of Asians, for example, are lactose intolerant because they didn't drink, grow up drinking. Years of evolution have engineered us to be more tolerant of another animal's milk, whereas Asian people didn't grow up drinking milk, so they didn't have the thousands of years of natural selection building up this tolerance to breast milk, or no, not to breast milk, but to, to cow milk. But I don't know. If I could live on a diet of breast milk with cherries in it, I'd be very pleased. <laughs> um, why did I add ovulation cream to the perfume? Well, again, adding ovulation cream to a <clears throat> perfume is kind of like cheat codes. Um, I would speculate that Carly's ovulation cream or Taylor Swift's or Ariana Grande or any of these other superwomen is probably worth more in weight or per gram or per carat than gold, diamonds, or red diamonds, any colored diamond that's a natural diamond, it is worth more in its, in its value than a violet diamond, which is a really, really rare diamond. The largest violet diamond in the world is only three carats. But I would say that ovulation cream is at least, you know, from some of these super women, is probably worth more in its carat weight than a diamond. If, you, if you're talking about relative to the perfume industry, it's worth more, I'm telling you. So, <clears throat> I mean, specifically if you were to market, market it correctly and release it correctly. I mean, I mean, it doesn't even matter if you market it correctly. There is a supply and demand with that. Breast milk, you don't really have the same problem. A woman can make a whole ton of breast milk, whereas ovulation cream, only once a month, a few days, and most of the time she's on the pill and she's not even making ovulation cream. Or if she's, you know, wanting to ovulate, then the mate that she's with wants to replicate with or wants to have a child with her and doesn't want her to sell it. He wants, you know, to go down on her and taste it because she's tastes better than any other, 
period of period of you know her menstruate menstruation cycle. I mean, there's really a, a, for the most part, men only taste an ovulating female if they actually do that sort of thing and go down on a woman or have an ovulating woman a few times in their entire life, and depending on how many kids they have. Elon Musk has 20 kids, so he's maybe had, and some of them are IVF, so he's maybe had like 10 experiences with an ovulating female. And I don't know, maybe he's wearing a condom too, so maybe that's not fully true. But there's a lot of truth to that though, I'm telling you. In the modern world where all these girls are on the pill, it's just, it's not very common to, to come across an ovulating woman, which is one of the problems of actually using ovulation cream as a perfume ingredient. But I added it just because I wanted to show to the whole world that the modern perfumer has it wrong. A rose is not an aphrodisiac, at least not an aphrodisiac in relationship to ovulation cream. It's not. Ovulation cream is the thing that males smell, even in insects, bears. I mean, a, you know, when a stallion smells an ovulating female, they tear up the barn to get to the female. They lose their minds to get to the female. That's not as prevalent in our species, but it's still there in spite of, you know, modern natural selection kind of breeding it out a little bit. It is still there. So, yeah, that's why you add ovulation cream to a, to a perfume. It's because it's the real aphrodisiac for our species. Why did I add the Mr. Lincoln and JFK rose? Because red, white, and blue, right? One's red, one's white. I wanted a red one here. It didn't work out. But, um, of course, you have Mr. Lincoln, which is a, an American president in JFK, an American president. There is an American theme of this perfume. So I don't just select roses at random. I, I like to select roses that have really good names that fit the perfume brand. But at the same time, sometimes you'll have a really great perfume like brand name, like Superman, Superman Rose or Superwoman. It's just, there's Superman Rose out there, but it's not very fragrant. There's a lot of roses out there that have really great fragrant like names that just aren't very fragrant. And I don't know. I mean, you can't do anything with a non-fragrant rose, even if it's really pretty so far as it really. Next on the list we have to discuss is marketing shenanigans. When it comes to coming up with a marketing campaign for a perfume, a lot of Perfume companies don't really do ads, and I think the ads that they do aren't all that effective. So I think they primarily rely on the design of the perfume bottle and some sort of little summation of that perfume. Um, they don't do perfume templates. They don't do any of this stuff. They do this stuff. I, I don't think there's ever been a perfume ad this good before. Um, perfume bottles, I mean, there's, there's some good ones out there. Most of them aren't very good, in my opinion. But... And critiquing perfume bottles is kind of another conversation by itself. But um, I have two ideas in mind to do. One of them is universal to all the perfumes in Zeus Muse. So when it basically what I'm saying is all Zeus Muse perfumes will have what is called a um, perfume ceremony. The second idea is an idea that I have that is specific to this American Cookie perfume. Unfortunately, it's just an idea at this point. But, and I don't have the script written. I have written commercials before, um, a whole lot, a whole bunch of them. I actually wrote every single commercial for a Super Bowl. It, it's a very well made project, but we'll just drop that for now. But um, I could definitely write a potential commercial for American Cookie. I don't know what it would be exactly, but I'm thinking something with the Cookie Monster and Carly. I don't know, maybe they're like cooking cookies together and there's like some sort of, it's the 4th of July and fireworks are going off. Something like that. I don't know. I'm, I mean, you have to have some sort of script. It's one thing to say, hey, we're going to do some commercial and this is going to be the theme. It's another thing to write the script and then you have to actually execute it. And the hard thing about executing a perfume, a perfume ad is it has to be at least somewhat visually fantastic because... That's kind of what sells perfume. I think if you're going to go for comedy, you might as well just do like cartoons or something. I don't know. Maybe I shouldn't go into some the my theories on per like what per what commercials should be and what comedy is, what comedy isn't. That's not what this is intended to be. What's important is there's going to be some some sort of commercial between the Cookie Monster and Carly with some sort of Fourth of July theme with fireworks going off. I don't know. Maybe there's like some barbecue like a barbecue. And the Cookie Monster and Carly actually bring cookies 
rather than bring barbecue items or their, I don't know, something like that, some, something to that degree. But um, the second idea is something that's actually universal to all the perfumes. There's what I call a perfume ceremony. I don't know, um, how do I say this? Basically, me and Carly are going to be sitting at some location, perhaps right here at this location. This is actually a, just a green lawn, and we're sitting in like a giant bouquet with flowers everywhere. And the flowers are going to be relative to this specific perfume. So when, you're, when it comes to the other perfume ceremonies for other perfumes, the bouquet that we're sitting in is relative to the ingredients that are in the perfume. But at this perfume ceremony, we are going to go through and systematically kind of present each perfume ingredient so that Carly kind of holds it in her hand or the muse holds that perfume ingredient in their hand. And then um, we then I then give her an option of different essential oils that she can smell and differentiate between which ones are actually selected as the final essential oil that actually goes in the perfume. I don't know if that made any sense, but like if you can imagine six vials, vials of oil and they all have different manufacturers and they're all a little bit different because that's one thing that I've learned with essential oils. We're not going to get involved in the, the creating of individual essential oils as a company. We're basically going to use the existing ones. And we're, we're, so we're not a company that makes essential oils. We just perfect the mixing of different perfume ingredients and the visual display and the marketing of the perfume. And I mean, in a lot of ways, in perhaps every way, a perfume bottle is just a marketing device. Like it seems like it changes the product, but the product is just a perfume formula. So we're not going to actually make any of these um, perfume essential oils. We're not going to go out and buy a whole bunch of um, rose fields or anything like that. We're just going to rely on buying the perfumes that are created by different perfume companies or different essential oil companies use those and but there is going to be a selective process by which we go about picking which specific essential oils are going to end up in the perfume and that's what this perfume ceremony is essentially doing i mean it seems like it's just some sort of ceremony that's useless it's not useless like we're just filming something that needs to be done anyway I mean, we're going to have to have some sort of process where we actually discriminate between, okay, do we go with, you know, there's 20 different frankincense perfume, um, essential oils out there. They're not essential oils. We'll just call them essential oils just for reasons of trying to keep things simple. But um, if there's 50 different, you know, as frankincense essential oils out there, we'll, we'll select between five um, based upon... I don't know, some sort of staff going through the different essential oils and picking the ones that they think are the best. We're not really going to rely on which one is the most expensive as a means of trying to find out which essential oils are the best essential oils at all. Um, but uh, we're just going to use our noses, basically, to try to figure out which essential oil is the best one, which one stimulates their olfactory system the best way. Because to a large degree, I think that the best way to figure out whether or not an essential oil is any good is to smell it. Um, when it comes to whether or not you think rose is better than frankincense or spearmint, well, smell it. I mean, I, I think that you should just follow your nose when it comes to actually picking a, a perfume, not just like this specific perfume, but perfumes in general. You should follow your nose in terms of selecting the one that you think is best because they are drugs. Whatever one stimulates your brain and makes you feel the best is the one you should probably use. Now, perhaps if your significant other likes another one, then maybe you should you know, consider their opinion too. But that's kind of what we do, is um, select perfume ingredients based upon what Carly likes. Um, I might have some say in sort of saying, well, I like this one, what do you think of this one? But she's kind of, all the muses for all the perfumes that I design, they're gonna be the ones who actually select the, the essential oil ingredients actually go into the perfume and at the very end, we're going to measure out each essential oil that is in the perfume and make the perfume formula on the spot <clears throat> and then spray it on. I mean, it's just interesting because you have these visual presentation of perfume ingredients. Then you have the, then you have the kind of smell-a-thon where you go through and systematically smell each perfume ingredient and figure out which essential oil that you, oil that you like. And at the very end, you mix all the perfume ingredients and you literally arrive at the, the perfume formula, which at that point was just on paper and you have your finished product, which is pretty cool. I, I th 
I am, I'm just speculating, but I would think that people would think that was interesting to actually see a perfume formula be made for the very first time. It's just interesting. I think that this perfume is going to be very, you know, very popular, if not the most popular perfume of all time relative to other perfumes that I make too. I think they'll, the only, that's the only competition that's going to have is other perfumes that I make. You could say I'm narcissistic in saying that, but that's just my opinion. I really believe that I am expecting to dominate the perfume industry if I get a shot at kind of showing people what I can do. But it, I think that people will think that, you know, the crafting of the perfume ingredient will be interesting, I guess. So, I mean, because it's, we're, we're literally going to do it on the spot. I think that some of that, some of the recording of the video might be a little bit edited just because, well, I'm not the greatest speaker. And I think if I say something that doesn't like, that doesn't come out clean or whatever, then maybe you need to edit that part or we record it, you know, separate times and then kind of piece it all together. Maybe that's something I shouldn't have told, you know, the public if the public actually watches this video. But you kind of need to have some degree of professionalism. I think that it was a mistake when Victoria's Secret showed these kind of the bad events that took place behind the set. I mean, though the entire that entire brand kind of worked off the whole fantasy system to begin with. So when you all of a sudden kind of show these, I guess, humanistic aspects of the company, I just don't know if it sells. I think you should always sell the fantasy when it comes to selling anything. So um, those are pretty much the two marketing techniques. So you have the Cookie Monster and Carly 4th of July commercial, and then you have the Universal perfume ceremony, which I think will be a hit. I mean, I, I could be wrong. We, we might, and the other thing that's great about the perfume ceremony is, I mean, yes, you have to create this bouquet, but from my perspective of having to actually put in a ton of work just because I feel like I'm the smartest person in the company and I have to do everything myself, otherwise it's not going to be as good of a product, I don't have to do as much. All you have to do is show up with the perfume formula and me and Carl, Carly just kind of improvise this scene or we're just talking about the perfume and just having it's just, just like a casual interview. You might want to implement some sort of like professional interviewer for the event just because I'm not the best interviewing talent. I mean, maybe Carly could do it and she could do it for all the other interviews too. I don't know. But I think it is good to have some sort of foundational person that does some sort of intermediating, intermediating interviewing like um, – What's his name? Andy, the guy on Conan O'Brien, who's always on the show. He's like some other person to like kind of make up for, I don't know, Conan O'Brien not being the best interview. He's a good interviewer. But they just keep someone else there anyway. I'm just not an interviewing talent. I'm a product developer talent. I'm a behind the scenes talent. So then all of a sudden, if you put me at like right in front of the camera and expect me to like put on a show, that's just not my particular skill set. So, um, yeah, I think it would be good to have some some type of interviewing talent. I understand Carly wants to have, um, you know, some type. She wanted to run, be a talk show host. This might be the chance for her to do it with perfumes. Um, and I think that this these interviews will be interesting, um, you know, visually fantastic. I mean, if you talk about having an interview right in front of this, you know, the U.S. Capitol, the, the Congress House, U.S. House of Congress, that's interesting. And I guess we could return there a year later and actually implement this design with the red, white, and blue roses with the cobblestone road running, running in the middle. And I think one of the most interesting designs or innovations to this Jewish Congress building is not just the rose fields with it, with this red, white, and blue color composition, but also these um, ballerina flagpoles. I, those can actually be implemented. I like to design things that look like they can be built. Perhaps the well, not perhaps, but the planet cookie in the background cannot actually be implemented. But this design of a ballerina holding up a flag, that design can actually be implemented. And one of the reasons I actually came up with this ballerina design for the flagpole at the U.S. Capitol was I was I was developing this painting. I'm like, well, Carly was in a ballet. What if I just put some ballerina in this? So I kind of Googled ballerina images, and I saw this image. I'm like, that's the one. You know, it just needs to be gold in color. Unfortunately, as you can see from the draft, this was just kind of a, a filter that I colored gold. The, the final painting will actually have a colored gold ballerina, but... I mean, how cool would that be to actually have a design like that implemented at the U.S. Capitol? I mean, that's just incredibly interesting. So, um, I mean, we could return there. Because the, the problem is, I'm very, very impatient. Um, it took me way longer than I expected to make it. I haven't even made it yet. And um, I'm 34 now. And I've over the years, I've produced a ton of different work. And I don't want to wait for another year to actually build this design or six months to build this design with the flower fields and everything and the planet cookie in the background to actually come out with my first perfume. I'm just, I'm just impatient. I'm kind of, you know, chomping at the bit to get my career started and, and get things going. 
I, we'll see what Carly says when it comes to like what how she wants to go about doing this interview. Does she want to go for the showstopper all at once, kind of a grand like a, a grand presentation? But at the same time, when you're talking about trying to redesign the U.S. Capitol or make innovations to it, um, you might have to pay for it yourself. Just because, well, there's a lot of different reasons. I, I'd be willing to pay for it myself um, if I had to, and I, you know, but. Um, I know there's so much bureaucracy over at the U.S. Capitol. It's just you have to like market your stuff to them to, in order to get them to approve to make a major league innovation to their U.S. Capitol. I mean, I mean, I mean, I would think that the Congress would really like something like this just because they're they're the people who actually do the voting. But I don't want to wait forever to to get this thing off the ground. If, if I will, I'd be willing to wait three months, maybe more than that, maybe four. That's it. I don't want to wait any longer than that to, to come out with my first perfume. The product's fully developed. Um, I mean, I guess at the same time, it will probably take just as much time to redesign and, you know, do all the landscaping that's incorporated to, you know, do the rose fields, put the, put these new flagpoles in. The, I mean, obviously the flag's not going to be difficult to put in. I mean, there, these are some minor innovations that are minor changes that add a lot, but as that's probably going to take as much time as manufacturing, you know, a hundred thousand of these American cookie perfume bottles because I think it will sell out within the first week. That, that, that's what I speculate. I don't know. I don't know that for sure, but that's what I speculate. So if you're wanting to manufacture 100,000 of these, because Elon Musk burnt hair perfume sold 30,000 units in like the first week, why can't we do that? I mean, a burnt hair, like how the hell is that even a perfume? I, I mean, Elon Musk does a lot of innovative stuff, but so far as perfume design goes, I don't think that's all that in, like innovative. But this is like the most revolutionary product ever in the history of perfume. I think it will sell. So... I mean, you might even want to go with building a million million units to sell it. I mean, it depends on how, what your price range is and, and how much you want to sell them for. Oh, we're going to get to that on the next slide, though. But, um, yeah, so business plan is basically this. It's not going to be difficult to um, implement this design. I, I, I'm, I'm, I guess, arrogant enough to think that magazines are not going to make me pay to run my perfume ads. It's a gift that I'm giving to their magazine that will increase the revenue, okay? I mean, I'm not gonna pay for ads on a magazine. So, I mean, if, if they wanna run my ads for them or run an article on my perfumes, I'm willing to do that, but I'm not willing to pay for ads. Just because I, I guess I that's how, superior, how much superior my product is to all other perfumes in the industry. They have to pay for ads, but I don't because my product is like enough to be a headline. So that's where I'm at with that. But that, that's just relative to, to magazines. Um, there's a, there's a, a million ways that you can, well, maybe not a million, but there's a lot of different ways that you can market anything. There's no rules in marketing. I mean, this perfume template or perfume, um, what is it called again? Presentation. The perfume presentation or the perfume ceremony is just a, one example of how you can market something in an untraditional manner that breaks the rules, that's unconventional that will, I think will work. Um, but uh, if you're talking about more traditional means of marketing your product, I guess one of the things you're talking about is how do you sell it? Where do you sell it? I mean, I don't think it's going to be difficult to find locations to, to sell this perfume, whether you're talking about selling it on Amazon. You could sell it on Amazon. You could sell it on eBay. You could sell it on... There's so many platforms these days for selling a product. If you have a product where there's a tremendous demand to buy your product... You can sell it. That's the bottom line. You can sell it at Walmart. I mean, there's. Uh, you can sell it anywhere. I, I think that the only reason why I might not be inclined to sell it at Walmart because I just don't know if it's a prestigious enough location to actually sell it. That said, I've actually designed a perfume retail house for this building. I have a lot of architectural talents, and I think that this design, which I may or may not have ended up um, attaching to this document, it's just a cat at this point, it's a Taj Mahal caliber building. So it's going to be expensive to make a show stopping building. It was designed to be a perfume house, but you're not going to build those on a massive scale. You maybe build like 10 of them at different locations all over the world. And then they're just kind of hubs to sell product. Um, just like you have the Victoria's Secret show, you have this big event that sells products in all the smaller retail stores. It's the same sort of thing. You're just doing it through architecture rather than, a TV show. It's the same thing. Um, but it's a show. I have, I, I mean, if you look at this, I mean, it's just obvious that I have some, some sense of architectural talent in terms of 
you know, perfecting existing designs, but I can come up with original designs too. Now, let's talk about the pricing. I, the reason that you have the 888 here, it was, that was the original idea for the price of each perfume. I like doing things in numbers that please me. I'm kind of obsessed with numbers and colors. Oh, I, mean, I'm a, I have a lot of obsessions, but I wanted each of these perfumes. This one specifically, I think I'm going to charge 888 for. We're going to come up with a different model when it comes to selling um, the other perfumes that have the gold, bronze, and um, silver caps because that's a different sort of design. This is the only perfume that I've designed that actually has this cookie, you know, kind of glass perfume top. The other perfumes that I've designed have a completely different kind of metallic cap design. Same shape, it's just a gold coin that kind of has the, but this rounded shape that has an image taken from the painting that advertises the perfume. Um, but uh, you're gonna need differently priced perfumes. Why? Well, these perfumes, again, ambergris is not the most expensive perfume ingredient in the world. The most expensive perfume ingredient in the world are the perfume ingredients taken from the uses in the perfumes. You know, the perfumes that are taken from some of the most beautiful women in the world, um, stuff like that. Those are the most expensive perf perfume ingredients. And then you're gonna have to create some sort of system whereby, you know, if you buy American cookie, are you gonna put your breast milk, ovulation, sweat, like the woman? Is a woman gonna put her breast milk, ovulation, sweat, and ovulation, ovulation cream in the perfume? Or are they just gonna spend a little bit more and kind of have this, these other women, you know, beautiful, healthy, fertile women who are not Carly Kloss caliber or status or whatever, um, actually kind of fill in to be the human ingredient donor for the perfume, like being a blood donor. It's probably going to, you're going to probably have to pay a lot for it, which is why you're going to have to charge a very high rate for these perfumes. Uh, and there's going to be different range, ranges, ranges in price relative to the perfume. And it's not just the visual display of having a silver or gold cap. But the really the most expensive thing that we're going to have to be deal with, and probably the most problematic thing problems that we're going to have to solve, are going to be relative to harvesting the human ingredients. It's just it's it's not a nightmare, but it's just going to be kind of difficult. I guess one advantage you could have is people actually harvest their own ingredients, and maybe we should emphasize that as a company. Just because firstly, I think it makes it more personal. You create a personalized perfume that you know you have the great brand that you want, but then you put your own ingredients, and it's like personalizing this brand that isn't completely yours and making it your own. I just think that's interesting. Um, but, uh, I don't know. Carly may even want to, I, I don't know. We'll, we'll see what she says to this, um, presentation. I hope she'd be really excited about it because I've worked a while on it and, um, I'd love to work with her. So it's the perfume conclusion. I am an above expert chess grandmaster perfumer. So, yeah. And lastly, I'll add. Feel free to read through my unfinished perfume Bible. That's kind of the last section of this perfume thing. And what you'll see in the perfume Bible is over 72 other perfumes that I've designed for people like Post Malone, Little Nas Sex, um, Michael Jordan, LeBron James, Tom Brady, Dak Prescott. Um, trying to think of them all. I've designed a lot of them. Um, who else? Zach Efron. Which is American, maybe I should name the name of the perfumes. I don't know. There's a lot of perfumes in there. I was just naming the males, but there's a lot of females in there too. Um, they're all very different from one another. I mean, people may look at this and think like, oh, well, this is, um, you know, how you design a perfume. And this is like, they're all the same. They're not all the same. They are all way, way, the perfume template is the only thing that unifies them in relation to another. And it's my most important innovation of perfume for sure. Um, well, I've utterly revolutionized perfume design, but just take a look at it. I think uh, if, n if nothing else, you'll be entertained by the different perfume formulas, even if I haven't even, even if I haven't gone through the trouble of explaining why, like all my thoughts behind the perfume, because in a lot of ways, it may seem like I just like obsessed over this one perfume. I've actually put more thought into the LeBron James Midnight Thor perfume than this perfume here, but because um, I was going to send in um, a book to him to try to get him to, you know, want to do business with me. But um, I put in a lot of thought into every single perfume that I design. It's not just this perfume. It's all my perfumes. So I'll leave it at that. Um, I hope you enjoyed this lecture or presentation. And um, this video was kind of created for Carly and for her management to forward up to her. I'd really like to do business with you. Um, I think I have a lot to contribute. 
Um, let's take over the perfume industry. So give me a call. Bye.